Hello, I'm Dr. Gabriel Esteban. As a Catholic university, Seton Hall is committed to supporting educational achievement within our community. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, NJM, Virtua, Seton Hall University, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Partners for Health Foundation. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth, and by Jaffe Communications where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? That? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Mr. Andy Anderson, who is retired detective with the Essex County Prosecutor's Office with the Vehicular Homicide Unit, and today the leader of the teen Safe uh, Driving Coalition of New Jersey. Uh, Andy, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Talk about the Teen Safe Driving Coalition of New Jersey. What is it and why does it matter so much? Well, the, the Teen Safe Driving Coalition of New Jersey was an offshoot of the uh, Governor Corzine's uh, Teen Driving Coalition that we had um, back in the 2007. Right. Uh, there was a rash of teen crashes and it became almost like an epidemic in New Jersey and, and um, Governor Corzine recognized that we needed to do something about it. Pam Fisher at the time was the director of highway traffic safety. Right. Uh, he tasked her with coming up with a commission. That commission was a 15 member panel that dealt with or looked at our uh, New Jersey graduated driver's license laws and um, came up and, and made them better out of that coalition. There was 15 members. I was lucky enough to be asked to be one of those 15 mm. people. So right now, let me ask you, and our friends at New Jersey Manufacturers, uh, Bernie Flynn, the team down there, have been talking to us about this, and others are concerned about it as well. But I'm curious, how bad is the problem with teen driving? It's the number one killer of teens in, across the country, and uh, especially in, in also in New Jersey. What are the causes? The cost? The main co no, the main causes. We'll talk about the cost primarily life. It's, it, it's not a question of them being bad drivers or anything. They're inexperienced. Driving is probably the most dangerous thing we do every single day. Mm. And the idea that we can just license someone, put them out on the road and be out there with everyone and expect them to, to be good at this, I mean, it's on-the-job training. That's the only way you learn how to drive and you get exposed to all of these risks. So what we want to do is focus on minimizing those risks as they get that education, as they get that training. Break that down. What are we talking about? And by the way, all of us who are parents of young people who are now driving and those who will be driving in the future are listening intently. Because that's when it becomes on your radar, when it's now your child is going to be out there. Literally, our son is turning 14, and my wife said to me yesterday, do you know our son Nick will be driving in three years? And it, hit me like a ton of bricks, like, our Nick, are you kidding me? Well, what should we be thinking about, all of us? Right now, at the time, you're, you're at the perfect time. So at 14, 15 years old, you graduate them to the seat next to you as you're driving, and you start talking to them about driving and how to be safe. And, really? And what to, yeah, because you want to get them in the mindset now, and you want them to start telling you if they recognize all the things that are putting them at risk. If they know about stopping distances and looking for pedestrians and watching their speeds and, and where to turn and how to turn, it's a, it's a process, it's almost, it's, we call it narrative driving. Narrative driving. By the way, we're putting up the teensafedriving.org uh, organization. Go on that site for more information. That would be incredibly helpful. I'm sorry, go ahead, Andy. And, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that we start having these conversations with your, with your child. Um, so in New Jersey, we've had, uh, we have really one of the best GDL programs in the country. Right. 
it's not the best. We're missing a couple of key components. It can be better. We're working on that. Uh, two of the key components that we need to do is have a mandatory parent-teen orientation, which um, means... Say it again, a mandatory... Parent-teen orientation, which, which would... means now when your son is getting ready to take driver's ed, you go to the school with him and you have a conversation and, and talk about what we're going to do. And in, the program already exists and is being taught uh, throughout high schools in New it Jersey. It should be mandatory. It, but it's not mandatory. It should be. It's voluntary. Should it we be think it should be mandatory. Okay, got it. Um, and then there's mandatory practice hours. We want you to at least do what New York State has done and have at least 50 hours of practice time with your son or your daughter. And that means 50 hours of going out there and logging how many hours you go out there and practice with them, and 10 of those hours should be at night. Why? Because it's important to go out. The more practice they get under tutelage, under supervision, the better and safer they will be. Andy, talk to us about distractions. Talk to us about the dangers of texting, which is just one of the many things people do to be distracted or to distract themselves while, in fact, they're driving that we do as parents, and then we're going to be the ones who are helping our kids? Talk about you're, that. You're exactly right. And um, we are the greatest influence on how our teens will drive. They're learning from us. They've started learning from us when we turned them around in our car seat and they started facing forward. So the kind of driver that your, your son or daughter is going to be, look at in the mirror. It's either going to be you or your, your, your wife. You know, who was the greatest influence? So, and, and when you talk about distractions, and, and I want to make this very clear, we've been driving distracted well before there were cell phones. Really? Right. All we had to do, it's not about what's in your hand, it's where your head's at. So, for example, if I'm driving here worried about how this interview was going to be, my head is worried about or thinking about what kind of questions we're going to... I miss where my should expert. It, be? It, it should be right in front of you. That's where the threat is. That's where we should be concentrating on our driving. Everything else is extraneous. So we should just drive. And when we do other things, when we're messing around with the radio, when we're texting, when we are distracted, when we're reaching in the back, when we're reaching for things, but then we're telling our kids how important it is that they be safe. Well, Actions versus words. That's the dilemma. Yeah. Uh, do we want to set a good example? And, that, and again, yeah. one, of the, one of the benefits of that parenting orientation is talking to the parents and saying, you know, we need you to set the best example. And could you do one more uh, on... Um Drinking and driving. Yeah, I can't imagine what you saw. And do you want to share with us what you saw in homicide? Um, if, if there was a way for every parent or every driver to see the damage and to see the impact on the victims, and motor vehicle crashes do not discriminate. They don't care how poor you are, how rich you are, what color your skin is, what kind of car you're driving. You can be a victim of this. And, and I say that as you're a victim. You're either a victim if you caused the crash or you were a victim of your, you died or injured as a result of this crash. So what we, we want to get through to people is that this is something we should be paying attention to. And the amount of people that were killed are killed every year in our country is, is staggering. 38,000 people have died in 2015. 38,000. That's up 8%. We, we haven't had an increase like that in 50 years. In New Jersey, it's gone up. It's gone up not as much. It's 1%, but it was 2% up from the year before that. So we're going in the wrong direction. In spite of initiatives that are helping to improve, like, what, is it share the key? Is it... Um, share the keys. Share the keys, right? Right. Which, real quickly, which 20 seconds. Which is the parenting orientation, uh, which is a 90-minute program that has been... Proven or, or created through research through the Division of Highway Traffic Safety in Kane University. Right. Children's Hospital Philadelphia did the research. We based it upon it's research based. It's 90 minutes, it's painless. And the parents yeah. learn about the, the laws together with their teens and how they can work together and make them safe. Andy, I appreciate uh, you joining us and talking to our public television, Fios, and digital audience, everyone listening right now, the leader of the Teen Safe Driving Coalition of New Jersey. 
thank you for the work you're doing every day on behalf of our children. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back. We are talking with Reich Sudam, who is president of the New Jersey Farm Bureau and also the owner and operator of Sudam Farms. How are you doing, Reich? Doing pretty good, Steve. And we were talking right before you got on the air. Your family has some history in coming to this country and farming. Go ahead, break it down. Well, it's, it's a long history, but I'll give you the short story. Sure. When uh, two brothers left Holland in 1663, they landed in Brooklyn. Right. And they created the name Sudam, meaning south of the dam, which is where their farm was back in Holland. And after 50 years in Brooklyn, one line moved out to Somerset County, New Jersey. And we've been farming in the same place now 303 years. You are a 12th generation farmer. Yep. What's that like? <laughs> well, what does, do you so, sometimes it's pretty lonely. <laughs> Is it really? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's hard work farming. And it's seven, it day, it's seven days a week. Well, why seven? Animals got to eat. Seven days. Yeah, they got to eat every day. You got to take care of them. You got to take care of the, your property and your crops. So it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work involved. But uh, a 12th generation farmer, luckily I had great teachers in my, in my father and my grandfather. So I learned a lot. And we keep going and we keep evolving. And that's mm -hmm. why farm families survive in New Jersey is by evolving with the industry and the needs of the people in New Jersey. Break down the Farm Bureau, what is it? New Jersey Farm Bureau, we are not the government. Sounds yeah, like it. Yeah, it sounds like the government. But we're not. Um, it's not the Department of Agriculture. No, that it, the Department of Agriculture is the state of New Jersey. Right. And there's also the USDA. Yes. But the New Jersey Farm Bureau is a grassroots member organization that advocates, we're independent from government, we advocate on behalf of agriculture all over New Jersey, north, south, big, small, all kinds of commodities, whether it's uh, aquaculture and growing oysters or cranberries or chickens, horticulture, which is the biggest part of ag in New Jersey. And um, Farm Bureau works on their behalf, both in Trenton and in Washington, to kind of keep government out of the way. Give us an example of what you would potentially be advocating for or against? Well, we have for farmers. Well, property, agriculture. property rights are a big deal. Um, in New Jersey, you're familiar with farmland assessment, which, is, which was a big deal. Uh, reduced taxes on properties that are actively farmed. Now, in the last couple of years, there was a lot of uh, discussion about people who were cheating the system. You know, rich people who only grew a couple of Christmas trees and got away with this big tax break. Is that wrong? Yeah. I, I think it is. Uh, th those that are actively farming and producing a crop should get uh, a discount on their property tax. It's like we like to say at Farm Bureau, cows don't go to school. Mm -hmm. So the impact of an agricultural uh, land base, it's very small on, on, a, on a township. Actually, it's, it's cash positive. Again, cows don't go to school. Even though it's farmland assessed, we still pay the same property tax on all the improvements, like the houses, the barns, et cetera. So, so why does it bother you if somebody, a celebrity or otherwise, has some firewood and they, they, they can justify with the government and say, we have enough firewood to say we should get an agricultural if, tax break? If they meet the rules. They meet the thresholds. Should the rules be changed? Well, they just were. They were just increased from a minimum of $500 on your first five acres to $1,000 on your gross Go ahead. Don't mean you have to make a profit. Right. But they had to at least produce some kind of agricultural product and meet yeah. that threshold. If they do that, I'm fine with it. Because then they're doing the work. Agriculture is the fourth largest, what, industry? Industry in, in the, the state? state of New Jersey. It's, it's horticulture, as I mentioned earlier, is the biggest part. We're talking about dollars, not necessarily in, uh, in people. Right. Because we do an awful lot in agriculture with a small number of people. But you in include... Um, the nursery and all the food products, and then uh, improving that food. You may be taking it from cranberries and turning it to cranberry juice. Mm. Uh, but all of that involves, uh, uh, I don't have the numbers, it was over 60,000 people in employed directly in food production. And then when you do uh, improvements to that food, the numbers go Wine a lot Wine growers higher. in there too? Yes. So let me ask you something. What don't the rest of us who are not involved in farming agriculture 
what don't most of us get or understand about farming? Because we like to eat. We yeah, like to drink. Every day. <laughs> I learned earlier, you're not much of a gardener. Oh, come on, because you saw... All right, Rick saw the gardening segment. You're right, I don't. I grew up in Newark. That's I okay. Didn't, I, that's not an excuse. I'm just saying. No, you may not be a gardener, but I'm sure you like gardening. You like fresh produce. Absolutely. Yes, what New Jerseyans don't get? Most of us. Or you many, I should say. I tell you, New Jerseyans, uh, not just New Jerseyans, but people are more connected to agriculture than they even knew. Um, we did a fairly Dickinson poll uh, at Farm Bureau, and 80% of New Jerseyans, at least once a year, some have, have, have contact with a farm, whether going to a farm market or a mm. farmer's market in Newark That's right. or others, that they're connecting. You ask what people don't know. Maybe they don't know that we work seven days a week. Um, and I love it. I'm not complaining. Uh, what, what do they, they know what, your average day? Probably. Uh, they, they know that we get up early and we work late and that we also turn on the lights so that we could work at night. How hands-on are you? I get dirty. I got dressed up for you today. <laughs> That's not your normal. No, not every day. <laughs> but uh, New Jersey farmers uh, have to do both. They have to be able to get dirty and be a businessman because it is business. Or a woman. That's why you mentioned it's the fourth largest industry. New farming is business in New Jersey. You're a businessman and you're hands-on as a farmer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Let me ask you. I'm curious about this. 12th generation, right? Yes. Did you have any other choice? Yeah, Could I did. you have said, I want to sell insurance? Yes, and uh, I actually do. But what? <laughs> I just, a, I, I just happen to be a partner in an insurance agency. I just as well. I, I threw that out there. I had no idea. I have that look. No, you there, don't. Yeah. I just said, is it no, in your blood? Yes, it is. I was the only son, and I grew up on that farm. At six years old, I was carrying milk for, for calves to feed calves, and I started driving in the fields when I was nine, I believe, harvesting <sighs> hay. Did I have a choice? Absolutely, and I. I was able to do both, and I love it. Will it continue? Yes. Uh, what's going on after this generation? We're still working on that one. Okay. <laughs> right, Sudam, uh, an incredible family, incredible history. Originally from Holland, Brooklyn, yes. over to Somerset, Somerset County. Yep. President, New Jersey Farm Bureau, and the owner operator of Sudam Farms. Right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Let me come out there and get my hands dirty. Actually, I wanted to invite you and invite you your, your, your viewership to come out. You think come I could to, actually, we could do that? Yes. Do you come wear gloves? to the farm. There, there's, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll get you gloves. Oh, come on, kid. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> to see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. Lisa Blom, Executive Director of Home Sharing Inc. How are you doing, Doctor? Fine, thank you. For those who do not know what Home Sharing Inc. is, you would say? Our mission is to create affordable housing solutions by matching people who need to share their homes in order to remain in them with people looking for affordable housing in the community. Who is looking? Who potentially could help them? Well, um, basically we have two groups of people that we help. So the first are what we call home providers. Providers and seekers, right? Providers Break and that down seekers. First. Okay, so providers are somebody that either own a home or rent an apartment right. that need either extra money or services in order to stay in that home. Um, and seekers are people that can't afford the housing in central Jersey yes. and need a more affordable solution. Break down the seekers. Do they fall into, I hate to say categories, but are there certain people that are in certain kinds of situations for certain reasons that are seeking, needing? Well, I would say both our typical provider and our typical seeker. The typical provider is an older adult on a fixed income who's faced with increasing taxes and inability to pay, or starting to have some care needs and still wants to remain in their home. The typical seeker is usually somebody that has experienced a job or relationship change mm -hmm. and doesn't have as much income for necessities as they did in the past. So that could be somebody that's post-divorce, um, laid off from a job, things like and that. What happens? But 
I'm sorry, I figured out what happens. How do you match How them? How do we match Yeah, them? that's people are sitting there going, sounds great. How do you match them? And that's the important thing to remember about home sharing. It's not just taking a list of names of people right. who need a place and people who have a place and matching them. It's a pretty intense process with a lot of vetting along the way. So the first thing that happens when, is they either call us or stop into our office, which is located in Bridgewater, and get screened. For By the way, your information is up there right now. So Perfect. people, sorry for interrupting people. The reason we're in this business is to share important information. Go on the site, get information now. Go ahead, I'm sorry, doctor. Okay, so we screen them, find out what their needs are, how much they either need to have in income for their homes or what they can afford to pay. Um, any other people in their household, see what their preferences are in terms of where they want to live because we're in um, seven counties in What about if they New have Jersey. an animal? you got to disclose that too, right? Yes. Or and kids or? Animals, kids, got all it. of that. And, you know, we're one of the few agencies actually that houses pets along with their That's a huge seekers. issue. It is a huge issue. Right. Um, and so that's very important as well. Anyway, we screen them, find out what their basic needs sure. are, send them an application. We then do a criminal background check, a Megan's Law check, and on their application, they've given us permission to check references. So we check three references that they've known for at least a year, no relatives from different walks of life, and then we interview them. And then we find out all of their more in-depth needs. Sure. Um, what's their daily schedule like? Are they in the house a lot, out of the house? Um, personality traits, um, pet peeves with living with people, and we do this for the seekers and for the providers. The providers interview is a home visit, so we can check out that the house is in good condition and everything that they say is there is there. When they've been through that whole vetting process, we give the seekers and providers mm -hmm. each other's names, three each. They interview each other. They decide How? their- Is it face-to-face? Um, sometimes, well, usually it is because the seeker eventually has to see the house before right. they decide they want to move into it. But sometimes it starts on the phone or at a coffee right. shop. They decide they're a match. We go out and do what's called a shared living agreement. A shared living agreement. Go ahead. Right. So that specifies what the seeker will pay each month in order to live there. If services are to be provided in lieu of rent or in addition to a lowered rent, um, what services they're provided and how they're provided. There's usually a 30-day um, notice that each party has to give each other in order to move out, although sometimes that's a little bit longer, um, not usually shorter, and um, talk about all the things that every couple that moves in together should talk about before they move in together. <laughs> Toilet seat up or down, toothpaste cap on or off, how long can the these, dishes sit in the these sink? These are important questions. They're huge. And your organization facilitates? That discussion. And then they walk away with the contract with the move-in date. Right. And then we follow up at one month, wow. three months, six months, nine months, a year, and periodically thereafter as they need it. <sighs> and if any problems arise, we mediate those you problems. You get back involved? We stay involved. So let me ask you, if I were to say, what's the longest match? 14 years. No way. Absolutely. Wait, hold on. What am I looking at right now? Our, our match. Our 14 year match, and they are still together. Okay, this is Jeanette and. Olinda. Olinda. Yep. 14 year match. Yep. That's incredible. Yes, it is. And they become like family. They're like sisters. They are sisters. family sisters. Mm -hmm. Your organization helped make that happen. Yes, we did. What's that feel like? It feels wonderful. And, you know, the important thing to remember, it's not just um, the people that I said. I said with the economic downturn, we now have families who are on unemployment and still have a mortgage to pay right. and are looking to get into this temporarily till they can get back on their feet and get sure. a job. So not everybody comes in looking for family. Some people say, I need one year, and that's their goal when they come to home sharing. So everybody has different goals. Doctor, are there more people looking than there are those who are providers? Absolutely, we have about two thirds seekers to one third providers. And that number, um, the ratio is starting to get a little bit worse, more and more seekers to less oh providers because housing is becoming less and less affordable here. So we get 3,900 calls a year. Right. And um, you know we provided 76,000 nights of shelter in the last year. So it's very cost effective. We're a small agency. We have three social workers for the seven right. counties we work in. What a totally different, innovative, powerful way, another way to deal with homelessness. Oh, absolutely. And it's not, you know, costing the taxpayer money to build buildings or anything like that. The only limit is to how many providers we can find. Where's your funding come find. from? 
<laughs> all over the place. Um, about a third of our funding is from foundations and corporations. Another third is from government um, and fundraisers. And yes. the final third is from <clears throat> individual donors. And if anyone wants to donate, they can visit our website. Um, there's a Donate yeah. Now button. Yeah, Partners for Health uh, funds mm -hmm. your initiative. They also fund some of the work we do. And um, important work, powerful work. Absolutely. Um, keep doing what you're doing and keep us mm -hmm. up to date, OK? Thank you. We thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, NJM, Virtua, Seton Hall University, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Partners for Health Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. There are still half a million uninsured people in New Jersey who are eligible for free or low-cost health insurance. Do you or someone you know need health insurance? Or has your insurance recently changed? Healthcare.gov provides all the information you need to find new coverage. Open enrollment starts November 1st. You may qualify for financial assistance or for New Jersey Family Care. Free local assistance is available to help you understand your options and get enrolled before the deadline so you don't have to pay the penalty.